we've come a long way in our understanding of the human body. We are also more aware of how diverse we all are. You can see that looking around this room. We've got a greater understanding of how things like diet, lifestyle, socioeconomic status, geography, and our nutrition influences our overall health. And we made significant advancements in understanding disease. But in reality, most of our advancements are due to better prevention, better surgical interventions, and better diagnosis. I don't want to drive you guys crazy with that this whole talk. <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong. But despite the significant financial investments we have made, we are still struggling to adequately understand and fully treat the majority of complex diseases. And we've tried to approach this by bringing together fields at interfaces, so fields like science and engineering and medicine. And this is based on the idea that each and every field has value, and therefore one has to believe that there's even greater value if we collect and collate these resources together. And that's a great idea, but the problem with this is that most of these fields have their own language base. They have their own way of approaching a problem, and they have their own way of analyzing their outcomes. So that sometimes makes this interface not connect quite so cleanly. And that inefficient connection gets more ingrained with us as we progress in our careers. So we might start out knowing a little about a lot of things, but as we become more specialized, we end up knowing a lot about a very narrow subject area. So our education system is raising generations of scientists forced to work in an interface without the necessary skill sets to be able to understand or communicate, at least across multiple sides of that interface. And that's essentially left us handicapped. That basically leaves us with two options. One is to create complex solutions to complex problems, where we really don't understand either the solution or the problem well enough to predict how they would interact together to achieve whatever our desired outcome is. The other is to simplify down the problem so much so that we lose all the critical important information, and our corresponding solution is so simple it no longer relates to the initial problem. Now, I think this happens in most scientific endeavors, but I'll at least give you an example of what this might look like and how it limits us in a field that I've spent a lot of time in, which is the field of nanotechnology. So nanoparticles are on the order of 1 to 100 nanometers. Now, to think about working at this scale, because it's pretty small, I like to take a soccer ball, compare it to the size of the Earth. Now, a nanoparticle compared to a soccer ball is the same difference in scale as a soccer ball compared to the size of the Earth. That's really tiny. But that's on the order at which most biology operates, and that therefore makes these tools potentially very powerful. Now here's how nanotechnology has interfaced in our current system working across multiple fields. A chemist might make a drug for a disease. They're going to hand that off to an engineer to put into a nanoparticle. And that's because nanoparticles are really good at protecting that drug from any negative interactions in the body. They make a great delivery vehicle. Now the engineer is then going to hand that nanoparticle with the drug in it off to a scientist to test it in some model of a disease. And the end goal is to then give this to a doctor who would then give it to a patient with that disease. Now, as you can imagine, each of these steps has a different language and a different way of approaching and solving their problem. The chemist is not necessarily going to understand anything the neuroscientist says about the drug's effects on hippocampal plasticity and microglia. And the doctor's eyes are going to glaze over when the engineer starts talking about encapsulation efficiencies and diffusion limited release. I'm pretty certain a good number of your eyes just glaze over right now. Trust me, this happens all the time when I talk to any doctors. And you might imagine that this inability to communicate between the fields really limits our ability to give feedback. This is probably why I spent most of my PhD and postdoc with my best friends being Wikipedia and Google. But this inability to give feedback then limits our ability to synthesize and adapt information and then move forward. And this ineffective communication is really difficult for us to be able to make an impact in human health. So if we want to make an impact, we need to focus on better ways to connect our information. But we live in a world and a system that pushes for specialization and expertise and development of a language base that is specific to our field. So how do we overcome this? I think right now, unless you want to add 8 to 12 years onto the educations many of you guys have already gotten, the only way to do this is basically to go against the system. So my own career path has been an attempt to go against the system and was therefore an avoidance of specialized training. And at every step of the process in trying to become interdisciplinary and to be at the interface of tackling complex brain diseases, I was pretty much told that what I wanted to do was not only not something I could do, but it wasn't even possible. So, missing a slide. So I started with a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering. 
And I had influences from, from philosophy and English and ethics. And when I went on to do my PhD, I was really interested in finding a way to apply chemical engineering to tackling neurological diseases. But when I started looking for a project or a position, I was basically told that what I wanted to do wasn't possible, and even that I was creating unnecessary waves. Now, I finally found a visionary mentor who was willing to give me a foot in the door, and it was really a small foot and a small, small crack in the door, who was then willing to let me take his use of nanotechnology and apply it in a completely different way than what he had previously done for his 12 years in the field. And at this time, I really had to figure out how to force myself to spend time with who I wanted to actually have used this technology at the end of my training. So fields like neurosurgery and oncology and radiology and pathology, and it sounds like pretty much anything that ended in ology. But when I got to the end of my PhD, I really knew how to engineer materials very well, but I really didn't still understand my application well enough. I felt like if I was really gonna make a difference in tackling complex brain diseases, that I needed to understand the brain from a brain scientist's point of view. So I once again went against advice. You can probably see a trend here. And I joined a very small lab that was doing very exciting work that for me was a complete field change. I went from chemical engineering to anesthesiology and critical care medicine. Now most of the work was in neuroscience and pediatrics. And it again took finding a mentor that was willing to take a risk on a chemical engineer who literally knew nothing about what she was doing. Nothing about neuroscience, nothing about medicine. But I was adamant in taking this step because I believed it was necessary for me to be able to be effective at these interfaces. And I would like to tell you that if you get to the end of the training process and you've tried to force yourself to be as interdisciplinary as possible, and you've learned to talk to multiple fields, and you've learned how to connect across those fields, then great, you guys are all set and ready to go and tackle these very interdisciplinary complex problems. But then the question becomes, well, what exactly are you? And the question, the answer to that is, you really end up not belonging anywhere. So here's how I looked when I came out of my postdoc and I was transitioning into a faculty position. And I'll try and go through this slowly because I think it's a lot to keep up with and it's a lot of words in anology. So I had done a lot of training in a drug delivery lab. I had eight years worth of degrees in chemical engineering, but my advisor was in pediatrics, which was part of critical care medicine. Now, my mentors were still chemical engineers, but they were based in ophthalmology. And I was part of a center for nanomedicine, but my office was in anesthesiology, and most of the conferences and seminars and work that I did was in neuroscience. So I had taken this path and forced my path to maximize the view that chemical engineering can be taken and applied to anything, but when I got to the stage to establish myself independently, I was no longer seen as what I had trained so many years to become. And in some cases, I was even referred to as a glorified matchmaker because I sat at these interfaces and I wasn't firmly on one side or the other. And while I found that amusing, it was also enlightening. It allowed me to sort of take a step back. And when I looked around and I talked to a lot of people, I realized what if con connection and matchmaking were what we actually need? What if our missing piece in trying to tackle complex disease is how we communicate and relate with one another? So the more I thought about this problem, the more I felt like we need to go back to the basics. We need to look at how we relate and how we communicate at these interfaces. So having been raised by parents who have dedicated their lives to human services, my dad is a minister, my mom is a nurse, there were several things that were instilled in me early on. The first is that every person and every conversation has value. To find that value, we need to be willing to come to the table. We need to be willing to come to the table without assumptions. And we need to be willing to observe and to listen. To apply that value, we need to put ourselves in the other person's shoes. We need to speak what they speak. We need to learn their language. We need to see it from their point of view. Now, trying to integrate my career experiences with my upbringing allowed me to look at the interface of engineering and medicine in a slightly new light, and it brought to mind some interesting questions and a different way of focusing on how we try and solve problems in, in terms of treating complex disease. It made me ask, ooh, these have gotten really out of order. That makes it fun. It made me ask, what if our challenge is not in designing new materials, but in finding better ways to connect and implement the materials we already have? What if our problem is not actually in our tools and resources, but in our approaches to using those tools? And more importantly, what if we already have the solutions? What if they exist in another field, but maybe we're just asking the wrong, the wrong questions? Now, I won't pretend that I have any of the answers to any of these questions, 
But I think it's interesting that we often overlook the power of effective communication for efficient connection, especially in a world that is driven more and more to be interdisciplinary and sit at these interfaces. So how might we even begin to overcome this? I think we need to go back to how we talk to each other. We need to learn how to develop non-specialized language bases, and that will allow us to teach and train students how to ask the right and relevant questions by looking at a problem from multiple angles, using tools they have on hand from multiple fields, not just their own. But to use these tools effectively, we need to remove the jargon associated with them, and we should look at common or overarching guiding principles. So here's how I try to do this in my work here at the University of Washington. In my research program, we're engineers and we're trying to tackle complex diseases and specifically those in the brain and more specifically those in, in pediatrics. And what we're trying to do is integrate both anything from the brain sciences or the clinical sciences point of view that works with the brain and engineering new materials. And so we take what I've made up and called a disease-directed engineering approach. So what does that mean? That really means that we ask one overarching question. What dictates our ability to get a therapy into the brain and only to the sites of injury and to have an effect? Now we use nanotechnology just as a tool to probe any characteristics of the brain that might influence that outcome. And these are characteristics that you would potentially find in any brain disease or in any brain. So things like how does fluid flow in the brain? How do cells respond to an injury? How do cells then die? Now we use this information to redirect how we would engineer the nanoparticle platform so that we can overcome or leverage certain aspects of the disease. But we're doing this based off of what the disease has told us to do. So this allows us to be completely independent of a specific material or a specific nanoparticle or a specific disease because it focuses largely on commonalities and how you might connect and scale those commonalities from one model of whatever we're working on to the heterogeneous patient population that a lot of us make up. And it doesn't have to apply to just the brain. It can really apply to any organ or any system of organs in the body. In reality, our body is this complex system of many smaller systems working together across eight magnitudes of scale. Neurons fire synapses on the same scale that our nanoparticles act at, and those signals get sent to every organ in our body on the same scale that's roughly equivalent to your height. Now, those are vastly different scales, but our body works together, communicates across those scales, and share resources. It's a beautiful, layered, intricate machine, but it is not one where you can take any one piece of it and address it independently from the rest. So why do we approach treating it in this manner? More importantly, if our end goal is all the same, to provide quality of care and improved quality of life for any patient with any given disease, why do we use such disparate languages, tools, and resources to try and reach that goal? Our ability to apply, and solve the world's, apply our tools and solve the world's problems is not immune to the notion that effective connection and efficient communication are critical founding principles in our application of our knowledge and resources. But the ability to maximally apply this notion needs to start early on in our training and our careers, not with a push to become specialized or the world's expert in topic X, but with a critical focus on how we ask questions, how we approach a problem, and then how we communicate and implement our ideas, our technologies, and our resources. I'll leave you with this. Science is often driven to find sophisticated solutions to complex problems. But in 1931, Claire Booth Luce stated that the height of sophistication is simplicity. And in reality, what is more simple, more fundamental, and more basic than the way that we connect, relate, and communicate with one another? Thank you. <laughs>